Hey guys, it's Hunter. Welcome back to another video. New year, it is studio tour and gear collection time. Let me take you behind the scenes, show you what I use for tones, how everything is set up, how the gear sausage is made. I still hate that idiom. <laughs> and let me give you a sneak peek of the ambitious mod projects I've got coming up on the channel for 2024. Got some really exciting content coming for you this year. So smack a like on the video if you're going to enjoy it. That actually massively helps appease the eternally insatiable brute that is the YouTube algorithm. And let's take a closer look. I'm not gonna lie, went a bit wild with amps this year. Not that I was struggling to get what I needed out of what I had. Nowadays, when it comes to recorded metal tone, plugins can get you the majority of the way there, especially in a mix. For me though, still nothing beats the response of a tube amp. They generally feel more inspiring to play, at least to me. And this year I got to try out a ton of stuff I've been super curious about forever. Starting with Tone Mountain, Georgia, these are the amps that are wired permanently to the desk. It's like a wall-sized analog camper that I put together last year. Absolutely wild, so much overkill. It works so well and not much has changed this year. Mesa Boogie Dual Rectifier, my first real nice boutique tube head and a metal classic. And at the time, I didn't know anything about amps or guitars or gear or much of anything really. Still don't, but Metallica uses Mesa. That's all I needed to know. I wanted one. If you haven't noticed, that's kind of a theme with my gear. Worked my ass off, didn't spend on anything I didn't need until I had enough to buy this suspiciously cheap listing on eBay. Like cheap enough, I thought I was getting scammed, but this arrived all the original tags on and everything. Didn't investigate further, we move. Had to carry it about a mile from the post office to the bus stop in Georgia summer heat. Didn't even care, was so stoked to get it. Used it for about 10 years now. It's been here since the start of the channel and it's still one of my favorite high gain tones. I never get sick of it. PV6505 Plus, I mean, come on. It's one of the metal classics. Found this well-loved one on Craigslist for about 300 bucks. It's one of the old American made ones, still has the original power tubes in there that really need to be replaced since they're like a decade old at this point and make this high pitched whine when it's on, but it hasn't blown up yet and still sounds brutal as hell. Rockerverb 100 Mark III has a completely different sound to anything else in the stable. Love blending this in for the demo tracks because it's super mid rangey, blends really well with something like the Scoopy Dual Rack. It was an orange B stock that was used on tour, so it has beer ring stains on the top, dented front panel. Got a decent deal on it. PRS Archon 50 Mark II. This was supposed to be a holdover until the MT100 dropped. Been stoked on that app for so long. But it's got a big American high gain sound, kind of rectifier-ish, but more raw, tight, and not as scooped. An uncommon blend of sonic qualities that I ended up liking so much it's taken a new spot on Tone Mountain for now. Angle Savage 120 Mark II. This is the amp I use the most on pretty much everything. I'm actually almost sure every guitar demo track I've done this year, the Savage is at least blended in, if not the full tone. I haven't touched the controls in like two years. Angles are so ridiculous. You can get so precise in the tone shaping, it's overwhelming. But once you nail it, Man, I'm telling you, it's both meaty and super tight at the same time. So worth figuring out what the f all the different knobs do. Speaking of figuring out things you haven't touched that are totally worth it, <laughs> roll with it. Over 8,700,634% of viewers have not touched the subscribe button. Here's your reminder to do that and turn notifications on so you don't miss any new videos. Plus, it really helps out. I'm trying to reach 250,000 subscribers this year. Ambitious, but I believe in us. We can do it. Right next to it, it's little cousin, the Iron Ball SE. The other thing with angle amps is the names are ridiculous. You got the Savage, the Iron Ball, the Fireball, the Powerball. So which one chugs the hardest? The answer is yes. Rev Generator 120 Mark III. This is a custom build in all white. It's so clean, both the look and the sound. Super versatile, and especially for modern high gain, it's got that German precision with more of an American twist. Canadians, man, I don't know, they're confused. Whoops, uh, forgot that I'm Canadian now too. American reflexes still come out, <laughs> we move. Houston Kettner Grandmeister 40 Deluxe, tube tone combined with a full digital effects suite. This is like a full rig in a compact tube powered box. It's an awesome feat of amplifier technology. Houston Kettner Triumph Mark III, this was my dream amp for the longest time. It has a shitload of knobs, it lights up, that's key. Nah, but I love the way Houston Kettner combines proper tube tone with crazy technology. Like for each of the six channels, you can set different power tube combinations. This isn't a universal boost switch. The boost is custom tailored to each channel, all with a super clear high fidelity quality in the top end that cuts through in a mix. Crazy sick amp. It looks really intimidating at first, but it's only that each channel has its own individual EQ controls. 
that's it. A lot of knobs, but the layout makes sense. It's clean, it's well organized. Speaking of clean and well organized knobs though, what a segue. Let's take a quick second to thank today's sponsor, Manscaped. And look, if you're on the internet, you probably already know what Manscaped is all about. Ain't nobody having a good time when it's looking untamed down there. And Manscaped is revolutionizing the world of male grooming. And they continue to push the boundaries of maintaining your boundaries with the new Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra, featuring the renowned skin safe technology. You've got an updated trimmer blade and an interchangeable foil blade that's tough on hair, gentle on skin, way better than the inverse, leaves you clean and ready to impress. Hygiene and presentation, both very important. And obviously, it's a sensitive situation. There's an LED light, so you aren't going in blind. So if you're ready to see why 10 million men have put their trust in Manscaped for their grooming and hygiene needs, head on over to manscaped.com to get a lawnmower 5.0 Ultra of your own. And if you use my code AGUFISH, you'll get 20% off and free international shipping at checkout. That's 20% off and free shipping with code AGUFISH at manscaped.com. Your balls are thanking you in advance. And while you're checking out the future of your jungle maintenance, Let's get back into guitar gear. Rev G20, first chug ready lunchbox head with built in two notes integration, so you can load on custom IRs for direct recording or go straight into the soundboard. And everything is set up for direct recording either into the amp switcher or straight into the interface, but like playing through a real cab is way more fun. So at the bottom is my trusty beat to sh Mesa 212 loaded with Celestian V30s. I got out of pawn shop for dirt cheap and Koshi is not treated with any respect. And then Rev has been such a great friend to the channel. So it's like a congratulations on becoming Canadian deal. I've now got a Rev 212. The logo lights up and matches the amp depending on what channel you're on. Like what? That is so sick. Moth Gang, let's go. Then it's got a mid spiky Celestian V30 paired with a kind of scoopy greenback. The blend sounds thick as fuck. So that's Tone Mountain, Georgia. Is it overkill? Maybe, but <laughs> shut up, it's fun. And actually we've got Tone Mountain, Georgia merch. Agufish.com, link in the description. Moving to the studio desk, it works exactly as I'd planned. So nothing's changed, except it's a lot messier with ADHD post-it notes and hard Hard drives and SD cards. If you run a Mac, you know all about that dongle life, but we move for now. All the big amps on Tone Mountain, Georgia are running into the KHE amp switcher, so are both cabs and the Torpedo 2 Notes Live, so I can switch in between any combination of amp and cab right from the desk. How sick is that? More post-its, my little cheat sheet of which switch is what. The Torpedo Live has been essential since the beginning of the channel. Got a great deal on it used because one of the rack ears is fucked up. It's like a physical rack mountable IR loader with a built-in speaker load. So that and the lunchbox heads are running straight into my Focusrite Claret Plus interface for direct recording. And below the live, I'm using a two notes torpedo reload as a DI box, a reamper, and a cab attenuator. So I can have fun with the real cabs without the neighbors calling the cops since I prefer working at night. I'm very sad they discontinued this because it's literally one of the most useful and powerful pieces of studio gear ever, especially if you're like me and you want a permanent setup without plugging and unplugging cables all the damn time. Currently I'm running an M1 Mac Studio, cannot recommend it enough for creative work. It has literally saved me so much time with how fast encoding videos is versus my old Hackintosh. And with this setup I can literally record a DI once, then reamp it, swap in between any amps on Tone Mountain on the fly with the amp switcher until I'm satisfied. It's a fuck load of cables, but actually using it, it's so simple, stupid fun, and it saves a ton of time. Oh my god, these long videos are killing my voice. Thank god for Matt Hapey's voice drops helping me power through. If you're a content creator and need to protect your voice as well, can't recommend these enough. They haven't launched yet, but you can get 30% off the pre-order using my code AGUFISH. Just a quick little plug there because they literally have saved my voice. The reamp signal also runs through my super simple pedal board, Rev G8 noise gate, Boss tuner, Digitech drop, Horizon devices precision drive, with the built-in gate. Everything is powered by an MXR ISO brick where each pedal gets its own isolated power supply. I don't really run pedals through the effects loop too much anymore, but in case of emergency, Boss DM2W, really nice warm analog delay, Boss CE2 chorus pedal, basically Metallica Master of Puppets Clean in a box, and another noise gate, an ISP Decimator 2. Love a good noise gate in the loop to quiet a noisy preamp like the 6505 has. Also, pro tip, don't clean your pedals with Clorox wipes. I have no idea what chemical bullshit occurred, but clearly something less than ideal happened here. In front of the DI box, I've got a Digitech Whammy pedal, greatest pedal in the world, and a Mission Engineering Rewa Pro. That gets heavy use as well because I can't solo for shit, and this covers my ass. And now getting into the amps that I've been dying to try for a long time and finally had the opportunity to this year, Marshall Silver Jubilee. I've been following the Gary Holt path when it comes to Marshalls, 
and as soon as I plugged in, it was like the exact Marshall tone I'd been hearing in my head. Like, I'm telling you, that specific flavor of British rock and roll tone, it was that. It's perfect. Exactly what I was hoping for. Instant keeper. PRS MT100. I'm a huge Tremonti fan. He'd been teasing this amp for years. So stoked I was able to make a launch video on it. That's wild. The high gain sound is like a rectifier with a crunchy mid-range, super clean fender channel, then a dumbbell inspired crunch channel. Apparently, I don't have the money for a dumbbell, so I can't confirm, but that was the idea. And before the Triumph Mark III was my dream amp, it was the Triumph Mark II. Again, it lit up. I don't really feel like I need to explain anymore. Found this one at my local Guitar Center use section, cleaned out all the smoker residue, replaced the non-functioning light. This was a flagship amp and the prices just crashed on him. The plan was just to do a video on a great value buy and then move it on, but it's like a pissed off modded Marshall combined with Hughes and Kettner's high fidelity sound, very different to the more modern and compressed Mark III. So I've actually been using it a ton, especially for the daily shorts. I love it. Victory Super Kraken. Dude, this amp, it's got the mid-range throatiness of an orange combined with American aggression. Kind of a Florida man rock -a verb This is another one that gets used a lot for the daily shorts because it sounds so good. Finally got to try an EVH 5153 this year. That was a bucket list amp. Didn't really know the differences between them, so I went for the biggest one that had Batman vibes and like, holy shit, even for a high gain amp, this thing has a lot of gain. But also compared to the PBs, it's more smooth, more refined, more gentlemanly. It's a wiser high <laughs> gain amp. I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore, man. It's been a long year. We move. And the last new addition to the amp stable, Diesel Herbert Mark III. Again, that Alter Bridge fanboy coming out. Miles Kennedy is a big diesel user, so I've wanted to try one for a while. This is the heaviest amp I've ever tried, both literally and in terms of tone. The story goes, Korn needed more headroom for their seven strings to stop overloading the power sections and stop getting such flabby tone. So Diesel gave them 180 fucking watts. Side note, that's actually why plugins and digital tones sound so good with super downtuned guitars. You don't have to worry about overloading the tube power section. The tone stays consistent, it doesn't get flubby. So that's basically what the Herbert is. An unkillable chug machine for low tunings. I'm actually almost done with the demo video, so look out for that in January. Now, a quick project update. A lot of you subscribed from the mod videos. There's some of my favorite to do. I mean, all the videos are my favorite, otherwise I wouldn't do this, but specifically Specifically, those are a lot of fun. And after the 74 Custom rebuild, the plan was to do more ambitious rebirth and rest of mod projects like that with my Luthier Wendell. The funny thing is, those brought a lot of attention to his shop, Wendell's Music, rightfully so. He's an amazing Luthier and an absolute mad scientist when it comes to guitar. Beast of a Shredder too. And he was already popular, but he's just been swamped with jobs since then. We haven't been able to set aside long, dedicated filming hours. There's actually so much work, he's been looking to build out the team in the store, so if you're in the Atlanta area and you've got Luthery experience, hit him up. But anyways, I've set up some cameras in the store now, so fingers crossed, here's some projects in progress that you'll see coming up next year. 1965 Gibson Melody Maker. This poor guitar, it's been through so much and it's been stuck in limbo for I don't even know, at least a year. Shout out to the viewer who sold me this project for a video. I'm sorry it's taken so long for it to make its grand reappearance. So basically the way I got it, it's been refinished, the pickup has been replaced, but none of the electronics work. No idea what's going on with the headstock, but the wood is great, and especially these old Brazilian rosewood boards are just, oh my god, it's so good. Great example of a quality vintage guitar, so I decided it probably needed an ever tune. So right now it's awaiting a refret, and then if anyone does refinishing or knows a refinish guy, please hit me up, email address in the description. 1981 Gibson Sonics, pretty much every single other vintage Gibson has had astronomical price inflation, not the Sonics. The Sonics is endearingly <laughs> shit. This is one of Gibson's cost-saving experiments during the Norlin era to kind of combat what was happening with Japanese knockoffs. The Sonics has a proper mahogany wood core, like a big, I'm guessing, multi-piece block mahogany in the middle. And then it's surrounded by what they called resin wood, basically soft epoxy resin that Wendell's coined mother of toilet seat. Bolt on neck. This has one of the widest neck pockets I've ever seen. A lot of chips in the soft resin wood, but it's got that thin Norland neck shape I like with a volute. The fingerboard is a nice, healthy piece of old rosewood, and the old school Gibson logo looks really cool. Then pretty much right after I hit buy on that one, I found another. This is a 1980 and it was even cheaper. It came with an original case that's 
falling apart. And overall, the guitar was in worse condition than even the first one with a horrible refinish job, and the body had been reshaped as well for some reason. Both have been refretted, and this one is actually currently out being refinished. The idea is I'm keeping the first one relatively traditional, while this one I'm going full modern. Ridiculous guitars. I don't know anyone that actually is a fan of the Sonics, but I love these wacky Norlin era experiments. I'm excited to see if with the right love, with the right mods, if we can convert some Sonics fans. And then this is one of my favorite Norlin era experiments, a 1979 Gibson The Paul. The The Paul is a grammatical nightmare, but look how cool this is. The guitar is made entirely of walnut. I mean, it literally looks like a big piece of raw wood. Throw in some pickups and you're ready to chug. They also have everything I love about Norlin Gibson's thin neck with a volute, oversized headstock, proper set neck model with an ebony fingerboard. This husk was in pretty good condition, no real problems except that the frets are completely gone. I mean, it's a 44 year old guitar. It's just awaiting a refret. You see the theme here? I'm killing poor Wendell with these stainless steel refrets. He so regrets telling me that he would be happy to do them. Happy, he said. And then kind of like the Sonics is another one popped up at a price that I just couldn't say no to. This one looked nicer, darker hue to the wood. Then it showed up and like, it was a bit of a problem. People always talk shit about Norlands and I never understood it. I love my 70s customs. With this, I kind of see where the haters are coming from now. <laughs> we move. Again, it needs a refret and we've since glued this one back together. Lawsy project, great content. But here's where I need your help. I love the concept of yin and yang, opposite and complementary. So do I go the route similar to the customs, opposite variations of a similar modern sleeper restaurant theme, or more like the Sonics's where the two are completely opposite. One very vintage inspired, one very chugtastically modern, or something else entirely. Nothing is too ridiculous. Let me know in the comments. And then I've been called going full boomer for this one, and yeah, that's fair. But I've always wanted a birthier Les Paul custom, and 90s Les Pauls are considered a good wood era, so they're not cheap. Saw this one on eBay, a plus top, kind of beat up so all the gloss finish is worn off, modded with a Bigsby 2 that doesn't even match the rest of the hardware. The seller forgot to mention that it had been refretted, and this is one of the worst fret jobs I've ever seen. 1978 Gibson RD artist, another prime rest mod candidate. Fluff was a big influence on me getting into doing YouTube. He's wax poetic about the RD a ton. This one's had a rough life. There's a small neck crack repair. The body's been shattered completely in a couple of places then glued back together so overall almost the perfect kind of project guitar I look for the only way it could have been any better is if it was still in multiple pieces there's a lot of empty space in the big ass rear cavity so to keep with the original spirit of the guitar I wanted to throw some sort of extra electronics in there my gut reaction was install a fucking metal zone because even though it's not 2017 anymore that meme will never stop being relevant but without a lot of extra routing there's just no space for the circuit board very sad so I'm thinking piezo maybe we'll see and the last one 1995 PRS custom 22 never really seen a PRS husk pop up before let alone one in the same color as Pete Cottrell's and that top had to jump on it the frets are absolutely disgusting a genuine biohazard but that's really the only thing about it my initial idea is to throw in some modern PRS parts so it'd be kind of a combination of PRS past and present but I'm still workshopping. If you guys have any suggestions, let me know in the comments. So with these, I'm trying to be semi-realistic going into next year, having fun with everything, not trying to force content if it's not ready. Just the sheer amount of footage takes a long time to edit. So I figure one every month and a half, two months, that's an ambitious goal. I'm gonna try to do my best for you guys. So again, man, like nobody needs a gear collection this big. Like this is fun, outrageous overkill. Some people think the point of the channel is, oh, uh, you need this guitar or this amp or this plugin or this whatever the f and all this other shit to sound good. No, man, not at all. The reason I put so much time and emphasis into the demo tracks is because that's the point. Gear is obviously my weakness. I love exploring all the different tones and getting inspired by new sounds or getting inspired by the feel of a new instrument. And I get my fun out of creating riffs and arranging them into something that hopefully sounds cool to more people than just me. Whether it's chugging away mindlessly or creating full arrangements, it doesn't really matter what gear you're using or what skill level you are as long as you're having fun. Obviously though, nerding out about gear just for the sake of nerding out, learning more, learning what's out there, that's a ton of fun too. So thank you guys for enabling my weakness for another year. Nerding out about guitar gear with you guys that actually give a shit about nerding out about guitar gear 
is the greatest job in the world. Love you all. Got some really fun stuff coming up for you. It's going to be a great year. Massive shout out to my amazing patrons. Their names are up on the screen right now. Consider joining them if you want to directly support what I do. You can also join as a channel member or pick up some comfy merch. All that really helps out. Social media, Discord, and affiliate links you can bookmark are in the description. As always, thanks so much for watching. You've been awesome, and I will see you for the next video.